Hi, I think I'm live. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Yesterday I had this awful feedback loop. Look, if I sit like this, I'm wearing my Napoleon hat. Oh, look, Napoleon, 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 Napoleon. Ah. Okay, I kill me. All right, uh, questions. What questions do we have? So let's see here. Um, ba, ba, ba. What do we need to know about the conquest that Napoleon had? I would just know which conquests he was successful at. Um, I would maybe know. I don't think I asked you a specific question about battles, but I think under Napoleon, you would want to know things like Battle of Austerlitz was his biggest victory. Um, Battle of Waterloo was his final defeat. Um, what else do I, and then, I, I, you know, there's the Egyptian campaign where he tries to kind of hit Egypt um, to try to hit the British empire in their trade routes. He conquers most of the Italian peninsula. Eventually by 1810, he controls like most of that. And it's not until he goes all the way into Russia and then he's forced to fall back and loses all of his um, grand army that things start to get bad. Um, let's see what countries he conquered. Yeah, so that I think that covers that. Okay, and then Ashley, um, so let's think about, Ashley asked, what was the first French Republic? So let's think about the order of the governments in the French Revolution. So we start with Louis the Sixteenth. Um, he rules until 1792 when he's declared a traitor and then he's killed in January of 1793. Um, between 1789 and 1791, they're writing a constitution, right? So when the constitution is put in place in 1791, that creates a constitutional monarchy. That constitutional monarchy had some major flaws. So for instance, the suspensive veto, um, gave the king more power than he should have. And um, he, he could kind of just sit on legislation for as long as he wanted to prevent any kind of radical change. Problem being that France was in pretty desperate need of change. So that's a problem. Um, so then he tries to flee the country. He's put under house arrest in the Tuileries after the flight to Varennes. And while under house arrest, um, the Brunswick Manifesto was published in Paris, that angers the Parisians because the Brunswick Manifesto said that if the king and queen are harmed, France will be leveled. So then they start thinking of the king as a traitor, right? Like he probably was involved with this. His sister's family is the heads of Austria who are one of the countries who are threatening him. So um, did I say his sister's family? His wife's family, Marie Antoinette's family is in Austria, uh, which is, mm, this is hard to do on this map, upside down and backwards. That little orange one right there, but at the time was like most of this. Um, and so when they, when the Brunswick Manifesto was published, the mob in Paris will storm the Tuileries. When they storm the Tuileries, they find evidence that yes, Louis had conspired to have that published. And so then he's tried for treason and killed um, after a very narrow vote, um, the he the National Assembly votes to execute Louis. Now on September 22nd, 1792, before he's executed, the National Assembly had voted to declare France a republic. Like we don't need a king at all. And so then that decision about whether or not to kill him is happening kind of once a new government is already underway. From 1792 to 93, there's a year of Girondin rule. So they're less radical. They're going for kind of slower change, right? And then the Montagnards come to power um, when the Committee of Public Safety ends up with somewhat dictatorial powers um, with Robespierre as the head of the Committee of Public Safety. And then that's when the Reign of Terror um, really picks up from 1793 to 94. The Reign of Terror ends with the execution of Robespierre in 1794. And then um, 
the directory begins. Directory is 1795 when the new constitution is written. So really, it you know, the reign of terror ends in 94 to 95. They have to write new constitution again. So 1795, the new government is in place. And then Napoleon stages the coup d'etat on November 9th, 1799. So that's the directory. Um, okay. How many questions? Um, I think... I think 85. I think there were originally 90, and then I was worried that people might not finish, so I cut a few off to give you guys a little bit extra time. Um, and what I did was, I mean, if, if you guys study your Enlightenment and your French Revolution study guides, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, I'm not going to Burger King. I assume that's what BK is. Computer broke. Yes, yes. Oh, Concord out of 1801. Um, I'm pretty sure that is on there. The Concordat of 1801. Concordat just means an agreement between a ruler and the Pope. And so the Pope and Napoleon agreed that the French would be able to keep the land that was confiscated during the French Revolution. So the civil constitution of the clergy real early in 1799 had confiscated a lot of church land and they were using that church land to back up the assignats, the French currency. And um, so when Napoleon comes to power, it's unclear, like, is he going to give that land back to the church? What's going to happen? Uh, if you know Napoleon, he's not really giving anything back. So he um, agrees, the Pope agrees to let the French keep that land. Um, and in exchange, Napoleon agrees that the majority of Frenchmen will be Catholic. Um, when the Pope starts to try to rearrange that, and I'd have to look, but I'm pretty sure that the the Pope who signed it died. And then there's a new Pope tries to renegotiate that. Napoleon puts him under house arrest. Uh, the Lycée system. I think you just need to know that it's the French um, secondary schools that Napoleon creates. He's really attempting to train a civil service. Um, so to, to train government officials. Um, it was technically open to all, though it still certainly helped to have money. You had to pay tuition, so it wasn't free public education per se. Um, there were some scholarships available to the poor, but for the most part, he's kind of educating like upper middle class people. Um, and then that's part of the evidence that you could use that Napoleon was creating meritocracy, right? That you could come from you know, not having a title and move your, you know, if you were talented and educated, as he himself was, right, you could move yourself up um, the government ladder. Um, yes, Luis, we can talk about Louis the 18th. Let me know what you want to know. I mean, all we've really said about him right now is that he's um, the Bourbon. So he's the, the younger brother of Louis the 16th, who's put on the throne um, at so he's put on the throne after Napoleon's first defeat, the War of the Sixth Coalition. Then Napoleon sent to Elba. Congress of Vienna starts to meet. Napoleon comes back. Louis XVIII sends troops. Napoleon says, I am your emperor. If you would shoot me, go ahead. Or the hat when I say that. If you would shoot me, go ahead. Um, they say, no, we'll join you. And so at that point, Louis XVIII kind of flees. And then Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo. And then instead of being sent to Elba, which is like here, he's sent to like, you know, over here somewhere like way off the coast of Africa, very far from Europe. Um, Louis is put back on the throne by the Congress of Vienna. So that's part of that idea of legitimacy that Louis the 18th was the legitimate monarch of, of France, the legitimate ruler. Um, and I, that's basically all that we've said about him so far. And honestly, we're not going to talk a ton about him. Um, he is a constitutional monarch. So he, he does have um, some checks on his power. So if we're looking at like, how did the French Revolution change any things? Um, he certainly had less power as an individual than Louis XVI did. Um, chicken Permissions, I don't know who that is. Uh, chicken Permissions asks, what's the difference between all the constitutions? Okay, so Constitution of 1791 is from the moderate phase. That's the the bourgeoisie demanding a constitution, um, demanding basically a constitutional monarchy. So that's what 1791 sets up, which makes sense. It's early on, right? The king is still alive. Basically what it says is you've got uh, three branches of government with the king as the executive of the three branches. So not a president, but the constitutional monarch. Um, there's still a national assembly. 
Um, and then there's, in this case, it was uh, called the National Convention, and then the um, judicial branch was separate. And so the king has, though, more power than he should. So the checks and balances aren't working quite right. That's the suspensive veto. Now the king is executed, right? Um, a new, I, we didn't talk about it. I don't think it's on your list, but there's a, a new constitution put in place under the French Republic. And then that only lasts until 1795. Uh, Robespierre's killed in 1794, 1795, the new constitution goes into place. So in the directory, they had three branches of government again, except instead of the executive being the king, as it had been in 1791, because the king was still around and alive, um, the, the uh, executive was this five-man oligarchy. So oligarchy means rule by few. So there's five directors who are holding that executive branch. I think the idea being that they didn't want any one director to have too much power. Um, but what they found was that it was inefficient. Um, it, the directory ends up being very corrupt. They're really not addressing the problems of France. For instance, there's still uh, uh, massive food shortages. There's food riots that will happen again in 1795. I'm sorry, in 1799. And um, the other, the legislative branch of the directory in 1795 set up the Council of Elders and the Council of 500. So the Council of 500, similar to our um, uh, House of Representatives, um, they initiated legislation and then the Council of Elders approved or denied legislation. So they're pretty comparable, I think, if you think of them as like the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, there's only, uh, I think, 100 elders. Um, so that's all the constitutions. Um, Reese asked about the Peninsular War. Uh, I just lost my questions here. Okay, so the Peninsular War is when goes back to Napoleon's style of rule, right? He's trying to get rid of British control on the continent and the way that he does this is by creating a continental system, which is like this blockade. You can think of it as like the wall around all of Europe. And then Britain can't trade with Europe. They're not allowed to dock in European ports. The problem being that Portugal, that little green country right there, uh, refuses to join. That's a pretty big hole giving the British entry into, um, into Europe. And there's a lot of piracy and a lot of smuggling happening. Um, anyway, but that's a pretty big hole. So France says to Spain, hey, Spain, could we? Could, could you help us out? We'd like to declare war on, on Portugal because they refuse to join the continental system. And Spain's like, no, nah, yeah, we're good. So um, France invades them both. And that is the peninsula. So the peninsular war is fought between France and Britain over the continental system in the peninsula. Um... I think if you dress well tomorrow, that always makes you feel confident to do well on the final. Um, yes, let's discuss the Congress of Vienna delegates. Um, I don't have my list in front of me, so tell me if I miss anybody. Um, Metternich, Austria, which would be, your map is different. Wait, maybe I have the map right here. Ta-da, map. Hold on, there we go. Um, all right, here's the map that you guys have. So this is Austria. Metternich is from Austria. Um, and then we've got uh, Alexander I from Russia. And who else is on your list? I'm just sort of drawing a blank here. Um, Castlereagh, Talleyrand, and oh, uh, Frederick III of Prussia. So what I would know about them is that um, let's see, kind of what each country wanted. So like Russia wanted um, to take over Poland, which is, I can't actually even tell on this map right here. It's the yellow one back there. They wanted to take that territory and just sort of expand their borders this way. Um, Prussia, which is on your map here, um, wanted to take Saxony, which I'm sort of guessing, but it's like up here somewhere. Um, Austria just wanted kind of a balance of power, but also to have be the main voice in Northern Italy and then the central um, German Confederation. 
because Germany doesn't exist yet, right? And neither does Italy. So Austria ends up coming out of that with quite a lot of power. Britain mostly wanted to just kind of keep peace on the continent so they didn't have to get involved in anything and then to secure their colonies. France wanted to keep as much land as they could and not have to pay too many um, indemnities uh, or like um, punishment for um, war, like war damages. So France ends up with basically its historic borders um, I don't know which document made Napoleon King. He, so he, um, in 1799, he stages the coup d'etat, right? The coup d'etat of 18th Brumaire is November 9th, 1799. And then he and, uh, becomes a, a consul, the first consul. And there's, there's three consuls in the consulate. Um, and there was that dispute in your article, they talked about like Abby CA wanting to have them all have equal power. And Napoleon's like, no, I just want to, you know, kind of consult with you, but I want to have the final say. And then in 1804, he declares himself emperor and they, um, they have a, a plebiscite to decide um, whether or not they agree with that. But as you saw in that article too, those, um, those, those votes were not legit at all. At one point, I remember them reading, they just threw 500,000 votes in because, you know, of course the soldiers would support Napoleon. Um, so abolition of the monarchy, Taylor, is just the um, the creation of the French Republic, right? We abolished the monarchy on uh, September 22nd, 1792, and France is declared a republic. The reason that that date is so important is that everything in the French Revolution is gonna be dated back to that. So like they create a new calendar, the new calendar day one, year one is November, I'm sorry, September 22nd, 1792. Um, Louise, I think you were asking about the significance of Louis the 18th. I guess his significance is just that he's, um, He's put back on the throne. He's considered the legitimate ruler of France. And so the, the two main goals of the Congress of Vienna, the biggest one, I think, is the balance of power. And if I ask you what's the main goal of the Congress of Vienna, balance of power, I think, should be your answer. I probably also would take legitimacy. They're trying to put monarchs back on the throne to, to undo everything from the French Revolution. So he's a symbol of that legitimacy. Um, Reese, the difference between the sixth and the seventh coalition, the sixth coalition defeats Napoleon for the first time and exiles him to Elba. The seventh coalition at Waterloo here will defeat him and then he'll be sent to his final exile off at St. Helena in the middle of the ocean. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about Napoleon's battles. Um, Luis, there's not much about the fighting in the Peninsular War on there. Um, Ariana, for Louis XIV, I would just know that two things. One, he builds Versailles, right? And the other thing is that he is the typical absolute monarch. That quote from him, uh, l'état c'est moi, uh, I am the state. So Louis XIV begins that consolidation of power under himself as the the Sun King, the, the King of France. Um, Simon, Danton was one of the members of the Montagnard. And so um, he was originally the Minister of Justice in the, um, in the French Republic. He's in charge of the um, Revolutionary Tribunals, which is ironic because when he suggests that the Revolutionary Tribunals should back off, that they should not have um, they should not be executing all of the Girondins. He's, he's kind of like, you know, I think we're we're hurting the revolution itself here. Um, he's very popular. He, um, he is um, much more popular than Robespierre. Robespierre, I, I get the feeling was kind of a jerk. Danton was kind of a, uh, I don't want to say partier, but he had lots of big fancy dinners and people liked him. Nobody liked Robespierre. He led this very austere, boring life and was kind of a jerk. So um, I think Robespierre really is threatened by Danton and that's part of why he has him executed. Uh, don't mix up, and Luis, I just see that, that you did this here. Don't mix up Danton and Darnton. Danton, revolutionary from the French Revolution. Darnton, 
still alive, I think, I'd have to check, he's getting older now, but a professor at Princeton. So Darton was the one who wrote about possibilism. Danton uh, is the revolutionary. Um, Rasa Taylor, I would just know that that is um, John Locke's idea of the blank slate. He was really concerned with epistemology. What is the nature of knowledge and how do we know? And so the tabula rasa is, is his theory on epistemology, which is that we learn only through empiricism. We learn through observation, through our senses, right? Through what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch. Um, and the way that we do that is kind of through experimentation, as opposed to like Hobbes, who said that um, life is nasty, brutish, short, and all people are basically terrible by nature. Um, John Locke says they're not anything by nature. They're whatever society makes of them, whatever experience makes of them. Um, so that's from uh, the work is called Essays Concerning Human Understanding. Um, the first consul government, the final decision is that Napoleon will have final say that the others will be um, counsel to him, but they won't be able to like override him. Um, yes, you should totally like my video so you can go back to it later. Yes, you're just asking questions. Um, con continental system. So Megan, that's that blockade. Like think of it as a big fence around Europe. It's not really, but it's blocking the British from trading with um, any of the countries on the continent, which is a really big deal because um, as we saw in the urban game, Britain has started to undergo the industrial revolution. So they need the markets and the resources from the continents to sell all their manufactured goods at. Um, so the continental system is that blockade and it does lead to the peninsular war. Okay, so Simon, I would say, so this question about whether he sympathized with the Girondins or the Jacobins. Danton is for sure a member of the Montagnard. He's a Jacobin, he's a Montagnard. I think he just thinks that eventually that he needs to work with the Girondins, not just execute them. Um, so I would actually say he sympathized with both. Um, in the Napoleonic Code, Reese, um, that was Napoleon's attempt to standardize the legal, the civil code. Um, so civil code means not criminal, right? It's about property largely and contracts. So um, he, he, under that, for instance, is our marriage contracts. So they reduced the number of reasons that you could use to file for divorce from 10, I think, to three. Um, and the reason that it's important is they are standardizing it for not just all of France, because France might have had one law here and one law here and one law here, right? Like all these different sort of civil codes, depending on, you know, properties, how, how contracts were made and how they could be dissolved and all of that. Um, not just for all of France, but for all of the territory that Napoleon conquered, which is most of Europe. And then it's exported to a lot of other countries. So the Napoleonic code becomes the basis for a lot of um, civil codes in the rest of the world and certainly in Europe. Um, I Hold on, this scroll's funny here. So da, 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 Jacobins. Eric, the final is 15%. Um, who's still alive? Oh, Luis, did you look that up? Is Robert Darton still alive? Um, did Scorched, yes, Scorched Earth. Uh, we talked about it in two, two places. One is during the Vendee revolt. Um, the Vendee was like over here in France. That's when they had that uprising against the church and um, against conscription. Hold on just a second. Oh, my tea is like the perfect temperature now. Um, so that uprising <clears throat> in the Vendee, the French will, the National Convention will authorize Scorch Earth against the, in the Vendee region and in anywhere where they um, were rising up against the government. But it also happens in Russia. So as Napoleon is invading this way towards Moscow, right, which would be like here-ish, um, he's living off the land mostly. That's what people did there. They 
pillage, basically. They, they steal food and things and supplies from people as they invade. So they're invading this way and they're getting stretched further and further and further from any supply contact to France, right? So to fight them, the Russians did something kind of brilliant, but something that you would have to, you know, not worry too much about your own people, but they practice scorched earth as they retreat. So they just keep running backwards. The French are invading, but as they're invading, they're hitting just burned, scorched land, um, including Moscow. Moscow was burned to the ground by the Russians to stop Napoleon, but it works. Napoleon marches with 600,000 um, military member or uh, members of the Grand Army and retreats with, I think, 40,000. Um, yes, Simon, legitimacy is the mentality of the royalists. Um, Napoleonic code I just did. And the, yeah, for the political spectrum, you just need to be able to basically recreate it like you did on your French Revolution test. Um, French, uh, so Reese, Frederick the Great, oh, what do I say about him? Um, he's the one who said, that he calls himself the first servant of the state. I really like that description of enlightened despots in general. That's how he sees himself. Um, he hosted Voltaire at the Prussian court for a long time. Um, he simplified a lot of the laws of Prussia. He made the legal courts cheaper and more honest. He gave them religious freedom. He created universal elementary education which is a big deal, right, for all classes of children so that they're, they're all going to start getting some basic literacy and reading and math. And then, um, however, he was a bit of a control freak and he didn't really train a successor um, and didn't really change this like very rigid system of social classes. We're going to talk a little bit more about Frederick the Great when we start next semester talking about German unification because I just found a great podcast about him and the growth of Prussia. But for now, just know first servant of the state, um, didn't train a successor because he was a control freak. And then he had all of those enlightened reforms. So simplifying the laws, um, honest and cheaper legal courts, which is a big deal because if somebody wrongs you, you have to be able to afford to go to court. Um, universal elementary education. Um, Declaration of the Rights of Man, I would know... Um, uh, just a second real quick. I don't know who Miroxy is, but uh, yes, the Lisi was technically open to all, but it was not free. You had to pay. So even though it was technically open to all, um, it wasn't paid for by the state. So that's like saying, um, you know, Regis is open to all, for instance, but it costs like $15,000 a year or something like that. I can't afford that. So, oh, hey, Keshev. Um, so it's, it's, available, but not affordable. Um, okay. So Declaration of the Rights of Man, um, that's, it's comparable to the American Declaration of Independence in the sense that it's laying out the main guiding principles of the French Revolution. Um, you guys read it in your book, in your article book, so you might just glance over kind of some of the things that were said in there. Um, good annotations can really help you here. Hold on, I have this little um, electric blanket and it's not warm enough in my office. I'm in the basement and it's cold. Okay, um, next question, Vendee Revolt. So the Vendee is this region of France right here. Um, what year was the Vendee? Somebody look up what year the Vendee was because I can't remember off the top of my head and I know if I try to do it right now, I will screw up the computer. Um, the Vendee Revolt would have been like 1793-ish. I'll have to look at the year. But the Vendee is a revolt against the 1796. Okay. Uh, the Vendee is a revolt against conscription, against the draft, and against the de-Christianization program. So the countryside of France is fairly Catholic. And um, they were trying to, to rise up against both of those things. So then the, the national uh, convention, the government authorizes them to basically be really brutal in crushing it. Thanks for looking up the dates, guys. 
Any other questions? We're only 29 minutes in and you're out of questions? Let me quiz you. Um, who wrote the Nakaz? Europe is important because, like it or not, Europe leads a lot of important changes through the 19th and 20th century. Yes, Catherine the Great, good. Um, what is the Nakaz? How would you describe that? Um, oh, here's more questions here. So I did First French Republic a bit back. You might just back up a bit and watch that again. Um, Montagnards and Girondins, the, the, it, this should actually be in your notes. Um, let me just answer the question about the Nakaz real quick. Yeah, the Nakaz is basically simplifying the Russian legal code. Like the Napoleonic Code did in France, Catherine the Great is trying to bring this enlightenment to the Russian legal system. It simplifies things. It... Um, it, uh, it it makes the law the same all across Russia, which is even bigger than France, right? Catherine never even visited all of Russia. Um, and so that's a really big deal. Unfortunately, she can't get most of the nobles to sign on to it. The nobility had not been as tamed in Russia as it had in France. And so they still had a lot of political power. Um, she is, however, given the title The Great for using... Um, for creating this legal code. And it's based largely on the ideas of Montesquieu. Um, and it's important because it's that application of enlightenment ideas. Cause you have to really think like the enlightenment is like, okay, these guys have all of these ideas, right? But none of that matters if nobody's gonna put it in place. So these legal codes, the revolution, all of these things are like application of enlightenment ideas. Um, difference between Montagnards and Girondins. So the Montagnards are, I don't know, is this left on my screen? The Montagnards are like far to the left. Um, and they're, I might actually have the political spectrum right here, but I don't know if I can share my screen with you or not. Can I? I cannot share my screen. Um, but if you go back and look at your French Revolution notes, you should have the political spectrum in your notes. So the Montagnards are more radical. They're further to the left. They are generally have Parisian support. So Paris is kind of the most radical city in France. The countryside tends to be more conservative. They were more, uh, wanted more of a federalist government. So for the, the national government to have more power um, at the cost of the local governments. And they wanted to execute the king. The Girondins, had more support in the countryside, as a result, tended to be a little more conservative, a little more moderate. They didn't want to exile the king, but they're still not, we're still not talking about people who wanted a constitutional monarchy. They did think that, I, I think I said they didn't want to exile. They wanted to exile the king, not execute him, but we're still not talking about a constitutional monarchy. Um, there's supports in the countryside and they want stronger local governments. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't quite say that the legal code is obtained from Montesquieu, but it's based on the ideas of Montesquieu. Eric, I'm happy to hear that even your pets can hear about the French Revolution because everyone should know. Um, did you guys ever imagine that you would know this much about the French Revolution? It's really kind of impressive, right? Mm -hmm. And once you start learning about it and you go deep on stuff, you realize how much it connects to, to other things. I think the past helps me understand the present. Okay. Any other questions? Are you out of questions? Edmund Burke. He is a critic of the French Revolution from the time of the French Revolution. So he's a primary source. He writes it in um, Reflections on the Revolution in France, I think comes out in 1790. So it's still in the moderate phase of the revolution. He says that the revolution went too fast, that the French made some big mistakes in failing to learn from tradition, in failing to um, look at their own past <clears throat> and, and 
and learn from it. Um, and yes, he's a critic of the revolution from 1790 and he's British. The civil constitution of the clergy um, passed in 17, I think it was early 1790, and basically is the beginning of the de-Christianization program. It said that priests had to swear an oath to the state um, and it begins the um, nationalization of the, um, of the Catholic Church's land in France. So they're confiscating the land of the church and, and making it um, part of the state. I will be at school early tomorrow, but I'm guessing that I will be trying to busily print off um, finals and stuff. So I might have some time to review tomorrow, but I, it might be a little bit crazy. Um, Keisha, the reason that the civil constitution of the clergy was such a failure is that it, um, it France was mostly Catholic. They didn't want their religion taken away from them. Like imagine, um, I mean, the United States is a relatively secular country. Like we, we have a lot more religious diversity. Um, religion is not as ingrained into the government as it was in France. And imagine if the president stood up and said, religion's over, like that would not go over well, right? Um, who is Jade in a box, by the way? Okay, the difference between the National Assembly and the National Constitu con uh, Convention, I think. So, all right, the National Assembly in on June 17th, 1789, so right before the Tennis Accord Oaths, declares themselves a National Assembly. Then at the Tennis Court Oath, they promise to tell them. They are then, they write the Constitution, and then the National Convention is elected. They are the legislature of the French Republic. How did the Jacobins react to the Thermidorian reaction? The Jacobins are in charge of the Thermidorian reaction. Um, they are the ones, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, just kidding. The Jacobins are in charge of the terror. I was reading that wrong. The Jacobins' um, reaction to the Thermidorian reaction is that uh, they're pretty nervous. They're the target of a lot of the white terror, so the kind of backlash terror against the um, the Jacobins because they were the ones who had committed the reign of terror. Pope Pius it doesn't really represent a country. Well, he kind of does. He represents the papal states. The Pope is the head of the Catholic Church. Oh, hi, Vivian. Um, and he's the one that Napoleon made the Concordat of 1801 with. All right, any other questions? Yeah, the phases. Okay, so let me just draw a quick political spectrum. We've got, oh, we're just going to put uh, Montagnard, Plain, Jacobins, Girondins, and Royalists. All right, the reason that I'm drawing a quick political spectrum is that I think it helps to explain the phases. So, um, hold on just a second, at least I'll get back to that. Is this backwards for you guys? The text is all, it's all backwards on my screen. Okay, so, um, oh, I've got to think. All right, so this is left for you guys. So, um, the revolution starts, they're way over here, right? The king has relatively absolute power. They're royalists. Most of the French government are royalists, obviously, because they work for the king. The revolution begins and it moves this way. The Girondins are kind of constitutional monarchs and um, they are in control in the first year even of the French Republic. Um, but they're still, these guys are still around. They're still rattling for things. We read, for instance, Robespierre, uh, making a, I forget, a petition of some sort to the National Convention before he was the head of the CPS. 
So then during the radical phase, it swings way over here, right? We've got the Monsignards in charge. They're like out with the old, in with the new, new calendar, new temple of reason, nothing old is good. Well, then that doesn't go well because the reign of terror is terror, right? So it it's out of control. And so when they then swing back to the right, um, that is the conservative phase. So the three phases are the moderate phase from 1789 to um, 1792, basically. That's the, the bourgeois phase too. The middle class is largely in control. They create a constitutional monarchy and it functions as a constitutional monarchy for a short period of time. The radical phase starts, I mean, roughly when they cut off the king's head, right? So um, the reign of terror under the Montagnards is from 1793 to 94. And then um, Robespierre is killed in 1790, July of 1794. Then the directory comes in. The directory is kind of moving back, not all the way to a royalist. They're not putting the king back in power, right? But they're moving back into a less radical phase where, where your average person has less control. They're trying to roll some things back to slow things down. Let's, you know, back off some of the crazy stuff that's been going on. Um, so that's the final phase from 1795 to 1799. Then you have the Napoleonic era from 1799 when he names himself first council, basically the consulate. 1799 to 1804 when he named himself emperor and he rules from 1804 to 1814 when he's defeated by the Sixth Coalition. And he comes back for 100 days and he rules for another 100 days in 1815 and then he's out for good in 1815 and they go back to a um, constitutional monarchy. So it, it is different. Like, yes, they go back to a king, but the king's power is checked now. Um, Yes, Eric, show me something that would make streaming, streaming things easier. When I do Google Hangouts, it's so nice because I can share my screen. And I I know that the, YouTube is like connected to Google Hangouts, but it doesn't let me share my screen in the same way. Okay. What else? More questions? My kids will be home in 15 minutes, so I will answer questions until they get here. something shiny on my bookshelf back there and I couldn't tell what it is. It's just like a gold leaf book. Questions, questions, questions. Is my K backwards for you? Do you see right there? I turned it around because on my screen it looks backwards, but if it's in the right direction for you, I'll let you. <gasps> Google Hangouts is dying? Oh, that's no good. Eric, you're gonna have to tell me more about that. Okay, Marat, bathtub guy. <laughs> you need to know more about him than that. Uh, what you really need to know about him is that he's a, um, a, a defender of the sans coulee. The sans coulee are the French working class. And he is a journalist who writes a lot of articles about their needs and, and defending their actions. Um, he's stabbed in his bathtub. That's why we kind of remember him that way as a, um, by Girondin. So by Charlotte Corday, who then is executed in um, the reign of terror. And I actually had a picture of, while you guys are looking up questions, I will see if I can find my pictures from France. So storming of the Tuileries, when the Brunswick Manifesto is published, um, it, it's, Paris is in, you know, enraged because this is foreign interference in French affairs. And they think that the king has collaborated with the Austrians and the Prussians. So there's riots in Paris. They storm the Tuileries the palace. So the, the Tuileries is the palace where um, the Louvre is now. And um, they find evidence that the king had indeed collaborated with the Austrians and Prussians and that will lead to him being tried as a traitor and executed. Um, I don't have your first semester review sheet here to answer that question. Let me look at it after the live hangout, Luis, and I will post a response to your question on uh, Schoology. Luis asked, do we need to study just the semester one review sheet or should we study all of them? It should be just the semester one review sheet. And here's what I'll do. If there's something on the test 
that's not on the semester one review sheet, I will give you the answer. But frankly, you should know all of these things. And I think it's good habit to go over them. Like, isn't it amazing how much you remember about the Enlightenment now reviewing it? Um, maybe not in the thick of things, but eventually you'll appreciate that. So if you like, I don't know, review these in like July of this summer, just to kind of refresh it, like every time you review it, it will, um, it will be fresh. Um, Eric, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it has the name Napoleon, but it doesn't it have like the Lycée system, the Continental system, the Concordat, et cetera? Taylor, I think that everything on the French Revolution sheet is for the most part on the semester one final review sheet. Oh, well then the answer to any questions won't be Napoleon, it'll be Concordat. Um, okay, March of the Women was caused by the rumors of grain in Marie Antoinette's palace. Yes, um, there, well it's caused, I guess I would say it's caused by food riots in Paris and then as they're desperate for food, they they decide they'll go to Versailles to try to take some. Um, other questions? There's no such thing as free points, Louise. Just like a free lunch. I'm looking for pictures from the, I don't have it here, I must have raised them off my phone. Apparently I have my pictures of the Girondin, um, uh, memorial at the, um, whatchamacall, erased off my phone. Sorry, uh, Taylor, scorched earth. I would just know that it's used in the Vendee revolt and in the invasion of Russia. I don't know if the answer to any of the questions is scorched earth, but I think knowing what scorched earth is will help you answer some questions. I don't know why, I think that that let them eat cake comment was just like one of the, you know, they said a lot of things about Marie Antoinette, none of them very nice. And I think it was just in that vein. And then it got carried down as kind of urban legend. Do you remember that quote about the gangrened lout from her three tiered belly? Yeesh. Um. Okay. You, Keisha, you want me to do the representatives of the Congress of Vienna? Yes, you do need to know those. What they wanted, where they're from. Um, Alexis, I did the Vendee Revolt if you wanna go back and watch, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes in, I'm not sure. And I did the Congress of Vienna representatives and their names. Um, who thought that um, absolute monarchy was a correct form of government because life was nasty, brutish, and short? Good. Reese gets the fastest typer there, okay. Um, who said that we should crush the infamous thing, écrase la infâme, um, crush bigotry, intolerance, superstition? Yes, Voltaire. Um, what do you call uh, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, and Rousseau? Philosophes, good, just philosophers in en français. Um, oh, you know who we haven't talked about at all is Adam Smith. Um, that's the answer to my question. Um, he said that supply and demand would move towards a natural equilibrium, right? The supply and demand curve where you would maximize satisfaction for suppliers and um, demanders. And what moves that? Equilibrium point is the invisible hand. It's like this. Invisible. Um, okay, you should also know about, yes, laissez faire economics is what you call that. So that's a good phrase to know. Um, how about Rousseau and the general will? 
what what do we want to say about that? Like the general will is like democracy, it's representative of the general will of members of society. So kind of this communal sense, that fraternity part of liberty, equality and fraternity. Um, who was responsible for popularizing the ideas of the enlightenment? They met at salons and published in newspapers. Yep, philosophes. Um, Simon, that definition that people give up certain freedoms to stay in society, that's the general definition of the social contract. And Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau all talk about a social contract, but they have different definitions of what the social contract means. Um, Hobbes says you give up a lot of rights to live in a society because people are terrible and have to be controlled, so then their monarch will have most of the power. Locke says the government should only um, protect life, liberty, and property. So everything else you kind of have the freedom to do. And Rousseau says that as part of that social contract, we need to pay attention to what the general will is. Um, so Louise, salons are just kind of gathering places for the enlightenment. Um, organized not entirely by women, but largely by women. And it was an important role that they played to, to talk about things. Think of it as like a dinner party, a smart dinner party. Um, Taylor, I don't know if the term suspensive veto, I don't think it's on there. I'll check here. I have the test right here on my table. Wouldn't you all like to see that? Don't break into my house tonight, please. It's not worth it. Um, now I just gave you the idea. Uh, I don't think suspensive veto is on here, but I think that the idea of the suspensive veto might be part of the definition of the Constitution of 1791. Um, oh, it is. I'm looking at the test, not the review guide. Um, I think that suspensive veto isn't on the test itself. Um, spirit of laws. Suspensive veto was just the idea that the king... Um, didn't have to veto something outright. He could just suspend a decision on it. He had four years to make a decision under the Constitution of 1791. Um, the camera is angled up too high. I don't know. It's my, is that better? Um, yes, Montesquieu wrote Spirit of Laws, Three Branches of Government, um, Checks and Balances. I don't want my face to be off of the screen. I see what I, are you looking at my nose? Is that what you're saying? Um, I don't have a lot of, um, oh, I can't move the desk. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you want me to move the desk down? Oh, I get you. No, you can't see my desk. Sorry. If you could, here, I'll show you real quick. There's like books all over it. This is all the stuff I have for Crash Course, that big stack back there. I've got volume, you know, the article you guys read by Lynn Hunt about the French Revolution. Here's volume five of that book um, to see if there was anything in there. I've got the Vichy Syndrome about history and memory in France since 1944. I've got Sexuality, the State, and Civil Society. I've got all sorts of history books here. Um, yeah. Anyway. No, you can't see the test. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm slow. Sorry, I'm still many times. Like, I can't move my desk. I'm with you now. No other questions, though, because if you guys are just, uh, if we're down to just cracking jokes, I'll probably let you, let you go. Go study on your own. You can tell me you love me all you want, but I'm still not showing you the test. I will show this to you real quick. Oh, did you get a screenshot? No. It wasn't actually the test, though, because I'm too smart for that. I know you could back up and do a screenshot. It was the list of episodes from Crash Course. Anyway, that's all I got. Yeah, I, watching the previous review isn't a bad idea. I go over a lot of the French terms in that. Um, yeah. 
All right. Well, I'm glad that you're studying for my final because clearly history is more important than physics. All right, I will see you all tomorrow. If I get there a little early, I'll probably just open up the room and let you guys study together. And then um, if I have time, I will um, answer questions that you guys have, but we'll probably start to um, start the test as soon as possible because I'm afraid some people might have a time crunch because there's 85 questions. So, all right, bye everybody. See you later, have a good night and I will see you tomorrow. Good luck. Ready? One, two, three, I know this. All right, bye.